education is the most powerful tool to change the world. We have gathered here today in the presence of some of the most powerful minds from across the world to discuss the topic, educational reforms. This discussion will highlight how the meaning of education has changed over the years and what are the amends and additions that we need to keep up with this dynamic world. To explore this theme in depth, I would like to invite our esteemed speakers and moderators of the session on stage. Mr. Simon Kwani Kir Kwani, Program Manager, Education for Peace, UNESCO Iraq. He is not only an alumnus of Symbiosis, but also the former president of the Symbiosis International Students Council. Ms. Sofia Bermudez, Young Education Advocate, Argentina. Dr. Arjun Deore, IFS, Regional Passport Office, Pune. Mr. Ulysses Brengi, Y20 2018 team, UNESCO's SDG for Youth Network, Argentina. And last but not the least, our moderator for the session, Ms. Lindsay Whitehead, Fulbright Scholar, USA. Good morning, um, everyone. What an absolute and distinguished honor it is to um, have this conversation around education reform. Um, it's a conversation that's been very near and dear to my heart, and I'm so thankful to um, my esteemed panelists here today and also um, uh, representatives and dignitaries, um, as well as uh, Symbiosis University. Um, I think that we could not be at a more prominent and important time to have the conversation around education reform. Um, I've been here at Symbiosis for the past nine months conducting my research on the importance of internationalization and education <coughs> reform, um, which is in alignment with uh, India's national education policy. Um, and so we recognize that India um, is at really the nexus of advocacy and education reform. Um, we know that India has a population of over a billion people. And as a result of that, um, we have to consider what that means in terms of transformation, in terms of impact, in terms of skill development, in terms of access. All of these important factors come into play. All of us are in this room right now because of education, albeit because of your teacher, as I formerly was, albeit because of your parent who inspired you. All of these things really contribute to education. But also taking that into consideration, we have to be mindful of the very important voice and role of youth. The conversation that we're going to have today is going to be very um, engaging and very um, conversational in nature because we want to have key action and key takeaway points in terms of how we move the discussion forward around education. Um, with that being said, we also know that there are great divides in terms of access to education. Um, these intersectional points around gender inequality, in terms of poverty, in terms of quality of education, are still very, very important concepts. We are still rebounding from the COVID-19 pandemic and the learning loss that has transpired as a result of that. Many children who are um, years behind in terms of their academic learning. In addition to that, we also have to be cognizant of children who are in uh, conflict-related zones and how education impacts them. In addition to that, we also have to be cognizant of teacher preparation and what that looks like and the relevance of education. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of turn it over to um, our panel today to kind of introduce themselves um, and then we'll go through and kind of share a little bit of our thoughts around some of these core concepts, so. Good morning, good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Kwani. Uh, uh, for Symbiosis, I'm Simon. And uh, I was a student here, uh, so this is homecoming for me. And currently, I work for the United Nations Education, uh, Culture, and Scientific Organization, UNESCO. And uh, my work is in Iraq, and it is uh, using education to build peace. In general, before that, I was with UNESCO in New Delhi, doing pretty much more or less the same thing. Thank you very much. Sophia? Yes, good morning everyone. My name is Sofia. I'm from Argentina. I'm a young education advocate 
Currently, I'm a representative of the UNESCO SDG for Youth Network, and I work at Education for Sharing as educational leader. I'm also a youth track coordinator of the Global Futures Forum. And I started my activism in education actually when the pandemic started. And my activism is centered in ensuring everyone can access education, no matter the place you were born or the socioeconomic level of your family. And my activism was inspired by the story of my family, as I am the second generation in my family that is able to access higher education. Ulises. Hi, everyone. My name is Ulises. I'm also from Argentina. Um, I've been working in education for the past eight years, leading projects mostly focused on skill development and youth empowerment. I'm also part of the UNESCO SDG for Youth Network with Sophie. And I was part of the team behind the Y20 in 2018 uh, that was hosted back at home in Argentina. So it's a pleasure to be here. And last but not least, Dr. Dior. Uh, good morning, everyone. Namaste, namaskar. I'm Dr. Arjun Devri. I'm uh, from the Indian Foreign Service. I'm from 2013 batch of Indian Foreign Service. I studied medicine, MBBS, and later on I uh, decided to go for the civil services. I studied, I came from a very uh, small town. It is called Chalisgaon, Jalgaon district. And I, I'm actually a product of, uh, how do you say, the government education system. And now I can think that I can share my experiences today. Hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I kind of want to open up the conversation around this aspect of skills acquisition and development. We are all here at Symbiosis University. We have aspiring students who I'm sure are really ready to get out into the workforce and also ready to graduate, I'm sure. And so Ulysses, I'd like to hear from you. What does skills acquisition really look like for students? That's a really interesting question. Usually I'm a person that when I have to answer a question, I start asking myself several questions. And so when I think about what skill development means, I usually go back to how do we conceive education and how do we conceive learning. And so far from what I've seen in different countries and different places, learning is about memorizing stuff. So that led, takes me to follow up question. That memorizing is meaningful. Do you actually learn something? It's impactful, it's empowering. And on the other hand, current most of educational systems conceive education as preparing us for what's out there. So prepare us, I assume that it's skill development, and what's out there is the jobs, work markets, and start to acquire a job once you graduate, either from high school or university. And that's where I feel like the educational system is already failing at. If we talk about skill development, we can divide it into two aspects. We can talk about the hard and technical skills on one hand, that these skills, they tend to change and evolve a long time. My parents, when they went to school, they learned how to use a typewriter. When I went to school, I learned how to use Microsoft Office and use formulas and spreadsheets. And now kids are learning how to code on, on data analytics. So hard skills are evolving and changing with time. And I'm afraid that the educational system cannot keep up with that pace, with those changes. So we are always like a few steps behind. And on the other hand, we have soft skills, which is my main passion, so I'm going to try to be short with, <laughs> with that part. And the thing with soft skills is that they do not change over time. They're always the same skills that we have to learn. Critical thinking, complex problem solving, collaboration, teamwork, effective communication, adaptability, resilience, empathy, creativity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the ways that we teach or we talk about these skills at schools is basically non-existent. We don't formally talk about them. And they're not formally implemented. Only really few schools and few countries can afford infrastructure to talk about hard skills and to teach students to go because not everyone has access to a computer. And when we talk about soft skills, ask yourself, when did you talk about creativity or effective communication or how to solve complex problems at schools. In my case, in Argentina, that didn't exist. So 
if we fail at the skill development, I can see that the school toward transition is already failing. Because I said it last night uh, with some of the colleagues, you graduate high school by the age of 17, 18 in Argentina, and you're supposed to know what you're gonna do the rest of your life. And you're supposed to get a job. But you don't have the skills or the requirements that the private sector is looking for. So you can see that the original way of conceiving education is failing because we're not being prepared for what's out there. So in many conversations that I have with educators, education reforms came up as like the solution for all of these problems. But when we start properly talking about educational reforms and seeing examples from Argentina, we see that educational reforms have a lot of challenges. And one of them is we talk about the bigger picture and the huge concepts behind educational reforms. But we don't dig enough in terms of, okay, what's the practical aspects of an educational reform and talking about skill development? How do we, do we bring this to reality? How do we implement it at schools, at different learning ecosystems? And then we can keep talking. Are having the right stakeholders involved when we have to talk about educational reforms? Then another huge thing is funding, especially for developing countries. Um, where the priorities in terms of financial aspects are in other spaces. So, kind of like all of this leads me to a, like a huge gap. So in many countries, we still have educational systems with frameworks from the 19th century. We have teachers from the 20th century or trained under methodologies from last century. And we have students from the 21st century that were born after the year 2000, which scares me on a personal level, <laughs> and that we are living in a, in a world that it's really unstable. So we have a 200 year gap. So of course the educational system is failing because we're not trying to bridge the gap. And I think that skill development, especially soft skills, is a really great way to bridge that gap and try to make it easier for young people once they leave high school. So I have a few takeaways to share. I don't think that we have to wait for big educational reforms to start talking about skills. Like, we have to start making explicit what it's implicit. Um, to give an example, in Argentina, you've seen maybe the World Cup, we're a huge football culture type of society. We have to start talking about what skills do we put into practice when we play sports. If we play football, we're talking about effective communication within a team, complex problem solving, collaboration. So in every aspect of education, we are already talking about and using our skills. It's just about letting students know that they're using that. So thank you so much. I completely agree. I think one of the things that we oftentimes um, don't emphasize or focus enough on are the soft skills. And oftentimes when you transition into the workforce, that is one of the most essential skills that you need to know. There's an old adage that you can come into an organization and you can have all of the technical expertise, but if you can't engage effectively with your team, if you can't have that uh, appropriate conversation with your supervisor or your manager, then likelihood of you being able to stay in that specific role is not very high. And so how do we have these conversations around the importance of these soft skills? In addition to that, as a former educator myself, I recognize the importance of these pedagogical skills, right? And so how are we as educators, as teachers, informing and talking with students about how to develop those skills um, and that level of awareness, right? Um, so thank you for that. Um, I wanna make a little bit of a transition and coming to you, Sophia, um, to talk a little bit about access, right? And what does access really mean? Um, we know that there are hundreds of students, especially as a result of the COVID pandemic, that still are not in school. We also know that access can be in terms of gender barriers and lines as well. And so how are we ensuring that people who need education the most, which we all know that we do, it's a fundamental right, but how are we really ensuring that these, these students, these youth, are actually entering into the education system? Yes, thank you very much, Lindsay. Uh, and I want to start mentioning something that was uh, mentioned yesterday in the presentation in the opening ceremony, 
We've been called today, we youth from diverse countries in the world, to talk about the most pressing issues on our time, of our time. And one of the most pressing issues is education. Because the educational crisis we're experiencing right now is putting, putting the future of our generation at stake, of an entire generation. And education was already in crisis even before the pandemic. The pandemic just made things so much worse, especially for countries in the global south. We were able to see clearly that we're still fighting the basics, that is access to education. All of these problems that the pandemic made more visible, that were the digital gap, the problem of the students that didn't have their own technological resources, they didn't have internet connection, or also that our parents have to do in some kind of way, as our teachers, they have to play that role as well to support children, to support students in their houses during the school closures. All of that affected, affected a lot of uh, children and young people around the world, but especially non-developed countries, and especially children and young people from poorer backgrounds. They are the ones that lost the most, and all, a lot of them drop out the education system because they couldn't keep up, because they have to study with a phone, they have to keep up with the school, um, the homework they have to do on WhatsApp, applications like that, that it's not the same as students that could have internet connection in their houses, their own technological devices, they could have the support of their teachers uh, a lot of time, a lot of hours, and that's not the same for, for students from poor backgrounds. And the thing about education is that the education crisis, it's a silent crisis. It's not something as climate change that we can see it we can feel it as the temperature rises. Education, the, things, the thing with that, uh, with this silent crisis, is that the things that we are not doing right now, we're going to see the consequences in five, in 10 years, when there is, to, the, there is going to be too late to do something about that. So I really want to make emphasis on the, that the, this is our time. This is our time to act, to do something about it. And I'm talking about leaders. They have to respond to the needs of our generation, of the needs of new generations. But also, I'm talking about us as young people. What are we going to do to save our future? How important is for us our education that is equal to our future? Education is equal to future. And to ask ourselves, what education means to you. Something as basic as that, because it's really curious for me that uh, we've been so many years inside of the education system, in primary school, high school, then higher education, and we're experts to talk about our education, right? Because who can know best what we need, what are the skills we need, as Elise mentioned, what are the knowledge we need, to, to be able to, to face the global challenges. And for me, education is the possibility to dream to be whoever you want to be, to have the possibility to make choices, to have better opportunities. And this is why it's so important that we as young people demand to our leaders to do something about it, to face this educational crisis, to give more funding to education, to actually be able to work in the ground. Because if the pandemic taught us something, is that educational policies that we were promoting over the years weren't working. They weren't responding to the situation. And they weren't working, they weren't sustainable in time, because these educational policies were made, were created for us without us. And it was so crazy for me that during the pandemic, I was able to see it, that in a lot of newspapers, the focus, the highlight was to, to listen to teachers' voices or to parents' voices, opinions, how they're going through that pandemic, that school closures and all of that. But no one was asking what are the opinions of the students. And we were the protagonists of that crisis. We were feeling on our own flesh all these changes and all, those, all this uncertainty about our future, about what's going to happen. And this is why our role is key 
because in order to be listened, we have to be so loud that they cannot ignore us. And there's going to be a day in which we're going to talk about that students, young people, is the center, is at the heart of education. And we have to be listened, we have to be key, key players when it comes to the creation, uh, the modification, the changes in our educational policies for them to be sustainable in time. Today, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> But this is our time to make our voices heard, because every movement that changed history is started from the ground up. So that's what we have to do. To demand for funding, for accountability to our leaders, that they are doing something now to address to this educational crisis, to demand to be part of the creation of the or own education, because we're active learners. We don't just receive education, we know what we need and also to demand the transformation of education systems, because today education is not a right yet. Today education is only for the ones who have the resources. And so still today something like going to accessing higher education, going to university that maybe for us is something normal, is something common, for a lot of young people is a dream so far away from their reality that they cannot even afford to dream it. And we have to change that. The fact that we are here, the fact that we have a lot of privilege accessing higher education, speaking English, for example, a lot of these things make us responsible to work for those who don't have the same privilege. And the last thing I want to say is that right now we can actually see how our future is vanishing in our hands. And we have two courses of action. One is to act, to do something about it, to ask ourselves, what can I do from my place? And the other course of action is to just see our future vanishing. Because in five years from now, our all efforts will be worthless. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sophia. Um, that, again, was a really um, important point. You really had so many uh, nuggets in there, especially around language. I'm so, I tried to learn Marathi. I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, and I'm still <laughs> not good at it. And I've been trying for like nine months, okay? Hey, I, so, was, I was here for a very long time. I don't know Marathi. Okay, okay. So I, we're saying that this important piece yeah. around language, right? And how that too can be a potentially inhibiting factor, I think is incredibly important. And the fact that language in many instances is a privilege, right? Mm -hmm and does limit or provide access to institutions. So I completely concur with that. Um, you also referenced a point around accountability and how are we holding our leaders accountable for making informed decisions, right? And how are we, as young people, um, engaging with our leaders to make sure that they're informed about the decisions that impact our lives? Um, Simon, I wanna kind of turn it over to you as well and just talk about this this aspect around quality, and what does quality mean in terms of our educational systems? I mean, that is such, I mean, in many instances, that's the foundation for what we're doing, right? We want to attend institutions that are going to provide and prepare us for the skills that we need. So could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Again, uh, a lot of gratitude for being here. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because uh, I am somebody Though I was pretty good at school, I really hated school, and, and, and here I am talking about education. Uh, it's, quite, it, it's quite interesting. Uh, number two, also, I think, I think when, we, when we talk about education, I feel like as a global community, we've gone 360. I think the circle is almost complete now. I, I mean, when my brother from Ladakh was talking, uh, 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 it took me back to say my village, to a lot of rural areas around the world, for example, what does education mean to them? Yeah. Uh, 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 in where I come from, we keep a lot of cattle, uh, for example. Uh, there are no schools. Uh, we live in little villages. What does education mean to my community, for example? And I think it comes back to a few things, which is the sort of uh, uh, really learning to live together with other people and with your environment. Uh, uh, Making a life in the sense of career is a pretty new thing, at least where I come from. Uh, because life means getting your sustenance from the environment in which you live in. And so, uh, and that environment is natural and is also cultural. And so the basic aim of education is to be able to 
uh, 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 coexist or exist in that environment and flourish with it. Uh, and I think this applies to a lot of villages and in sort of rural areas around the world. And then came industrial revolution. And okay, this is terrible, guys. Education has to be somehow mechanical. Uh, and suddenly, this is primitive, whatever these rural uh, indigenous communities used to do for a very long time, and pretty well, uh, 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 is suddenly primitive. Uh, and, 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 and so I feel like 200 years later, we have plundered the planet uh, somehow. Uh, and because we are now afraid that we might be extinct, it's quite interesting, huh? We are intelligent enough that our own actions might be the reason to why we are extinct. Uh, and, and we realize, oh, maybe there was something back there with those indigenous primitive communities. And we are trying to go back. We've lost 200 years. To bring the point that I'm trying to make home, uh, I graduated from Simbi. I have an MBA. Uh, to a lot of people where I come from, that is education. I, I am educated. But I feel like my entire education has come at a price. Uh, uh, and the price is that I have almost forgotten my culture. Uh, I, I cannot write Dinka, my mother tongue. I cannot write it. Uh, I think in English. Uh, 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 I should be thinking in my language and then translate that to English. It's the other way around. And, and I have to listen to songs, my old traditional songs, uh, in India and in Iraq to try and uh, recover what I lost. Now, it shouldn't have been this way. Uh, 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 there is a potential middle ground where I could have learned to be a politician, to be a policymaker, to be a bureaucrat, but at the same time, very embodied, uh, 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 very rooted sort of, sort of a person. And, and, and so quality for me means this, this middle path. Uh, 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 again, when I left this institution, uh, 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 when people ask me, what do you do? I say, I work with the United Nations Agency for Education, Science and Culture. I studied banking and finance. Uh, 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 and so what prepared me for that? And, and of course, it's not, to, it's not to market symbiosis to symbiosis. Uh, but I was in the council for five years, uh, five full years. And I can, I can tell you, uh, of course, I have been, I've been very lucky, but I can tell you, these five years in the council is why I work with UNESCO. Uh, of course, being an MBA student gave me a lot of uh, grounding in economics, uh, in finance, uh, and so on. But when it comes to really what matters in my job today is what I learned when I was working with my fellow uh, students to try and do activities for fellow students. Schools these days don't have that. Uh, a lot of schools don't have that. Uh, kids spend like eight hours in class. Eight hours. Uh, two hours, one subject, two hours, another subject. Play is like 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Uh, I mean, they should be playing six hours and maybe learning two hours. Uh, it, it, it shouldn't be the other way around. They should be playing more. They should be interacting more. They should be doing a lot of fun stuff than just sitting in the class uh, uh, and learning some sort of very, sometimes very abstract languages and sort of content, they should be playing more. So I think quality is education as embodied, really embodied in the environment uh, and in the people that you live with. Quality is education as fun and playful. And most importantly, quality is education giving you skills necessary for you to be able to do that. That is the ability to think for yourself, uh, 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 which is a kid in New Delhi one day asked me, uh, asked the Minister of Education, it was a conference, and I will end with this. It was like, sir, I'm struggling. Uh, in the national education policy, you want critical thinkers. But you do everything. Huh? Everything that is done of school is, in school is against critical thinking. Okay, how do, how do I unify this? Uh, and afterwards, I told the young man, it's like, no, 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 it's not in the interest of your government and your country for you to be very critical. Uh, but I think it should be in the interest of the country for people to be critical, because otherwise, uh, all we will end up doing is actually extinct ourselves at some point. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you, thank you. Again, so many important points there, right? This aspect around indigenous, indigenous knowledge, right? And going back and tapping into our roots and where we really come from and being mindful and sensitive to that um, and recognizing that that too has its place, right? Um, and then this whole aspect around creativity and innovation and creating space for, for students to be able to be creative, which makes me think in my mind as a, t as a former teacher, like the pedagogy and the practices that teachers utilize in order to spur creativity in the classroom. Um, I mean, I can think back to, even within the context of the United States, how educational systems are very rote in memorization, and you come in and you sit down and you take the test, but these aspects around critical thinking skills and being able to apply that with ingenuity aren't always, aren't always prominent, so I, I, I appreciate that. Um, Dr. Doerr, um, wanted to just, considering your expertise, especially within the educational sector, um, wanted to just get your perspective in terms of higher education and where India is right now, and where do you foresee that being within the next 10 years? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to stress here the views that I'm going to present are personal. I'm not going on behalf, behalf of any government institutions. These are my own experiences, my own observations. But before I start, you know, let me have one important thought that I want to put out here. I truly believe the goal of an education system should be to create you know, knowledgeable individuals who are well adjusted in the present, but are also better prepared for the future challenges that none of us might not be aware of. Because technology today is growing at an exponential level. But few fundamental features always remain constant. For example, hard work, Ability to understand an issue and try to apply what you already know. Because the problem might be new, but the solution that you already have might be working. And one should not, I mean, the individual should be seen as a contributing member to the society, just not from the economics perspective. Because if you reduce that person to a mere number, you know, you lose out the invis invisible nature of certain parameters or certain things that are being contributed, that are not being, uh, let's say, counted in terms of, let's say, crude numbers like GDP, and, but are necessary to have a well-adjusted or, I would say, highly functional, secure, and civilized world that we, everybody dreams of. Let's say, for example, not having too much of, uh, let's say, crime in your neighborhood, right? So these factors will come when there is someone at home or at school teaching kids the basics which are standard and which does not require any special means right now. And we should not be losing out, for example, uh, with this shiny means, let's say technology, something new comes up. Don't just go for the sake of the technology for that, you know, why it is necessary. Do, do you really need to have that? Because what you need to do is, especially for uh, when you have a very tight budget, you need to prioritize. You need to see, do I really need, I have old computer, right? Uh, if I can use with, let's say, certain system, this is still workable. I can have 10 such old computers, or should I go for one MacBook? That you have to decide. Or do you want to make just a statement, you know, that our school has, let's say, MacBook. That is what the tagline you want to have. But having said that, I do understand, and I'm a realist, that money talks, and having more money is also important. So that is what the uh, approach here is for any economy. The more money that you have, the more infrastructure you can build, and better amenities that you can give to your citizens as well. So that is what I want to focus on, the national education policy that we have, the Government of India has, and the, its international component. You know, how Government of India is trying to bring more investment, more students, or have better collaboration or better exchanges through that. So, few facts on this. We already know, I mean, even if I ask in this audience here, how many want to go to US for higher studies? Almost all of you will raise your hands. Really? 
<laughs> it's, it's, it's good crowd. Thank you. Thank you. But the numbers overall, you know, at Pan India level, something say otherwise. Because growing number of students are going outside. And the number is every year it is increasing. They are going for science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and all other domains. But what happens when a student goes out from here to there, he generally tries to, you know, settle out there as well. So the government has spent a considerable amount of money. The family, the community has spent a lot of money. But at the end of the day, what happens, the talent from here goes out and settles abroad. So that is one problem that we are trying to see how to address that. So if we have higher uh, education institute here, based in India, let's say from outside the campuses, they are allowed to be opened here, the students will be here. The money will still remain in our economy. It will not go out. And the job opportunities surrounding that will also be created. So many of the students will, let's say, want, just to give a crude example, they will order food from they will not order from a U.S. if you're not based in U.S. So they will order from a local economy, local restaurant, and he will eventually gain from that. So the money also stays in the system. And with that, when you open doors to uh, foreign students to come here as well, so there will be better collaboration. You will eventually also raise the standards of education within the country, and thereby reduce the need for the students from India going abroad. Currently, India also offers scholarships and courses for various programs and subjects in Indology, Indian languages, uh, then IU systems of medicine, yoga, arts, to thousands of students through Indian Council for Cultural Relations and through ITEC as well. So we are already doing you know, something that is the, through Ministry of External Affairs. These programs have already been implemented. And when we talk about the market size on this, is India, as you know, that we are the second most populous country as of now, and the age of people between 5 to 24 years is about 580 million. So imagine the size that you have here, and the education sector is estimated to reach 225 billion by 2025. So just five years ago, the numbers, I mean, what was the number? They're almost being doubled in just five years. So this is what we are talking about here. There is tremendous potential. And how the government is actually trying to see how we can make best use of this is, first, there's an initiative to increase the spending of GDP on the education sector. Currently, it is around 3%. I think the government is gradually trying to increase it to the 6% so that better and better uh, solutions and infrastructure is provided. The national education policy that I talked about, it talks about more collaboration, international collaboration, exchanges, then MOUs. The universities can have MOUs, existing universities can have MOUs there. And international offices at the various uh, institutions, higher education learning centers. Then we have something called uh, a gift city in Gujarat and some other models that we have where we are allowing the foreign entities to come there and set up their offices. So we are making it more business friendly for the international university to, to come here and to set up their offices as well. And again, the University Grant Commission is also offering twinning joint and dual degree programs. And there is a draft resolution as of now which will allow to have the foreign university to have physical campuses here as well. So again, we are bringing, rather than the students going from here to outside. Imagine if the campus is already here, it becomes much more easier for a student to get, and also get you know, that tagline at least. OK, I am from so and so university. So that also increases his you know, value in the market, if I can say. And we also have something called uh, GIAN, that is Global Initiative of Academic Networks. So a foreign academicians can come you know, for limited time in India and can give their expertise. Let's say Symbiosis invites, let's say, some other uh, university professor coming here or other, I'm saying. So you get that experience as well, so which you otherwise might be missing out in. Or that is, let's say, you're looking for that specific course. You need not go to that uh, other country just to have that course. So it actually, we are trying to find these solutions as well. And others is called uh, Spark. The Scheme for Promotion of Academic Research Collaboration and Leadership Academic pro uh, Program. So these are various programs under you know, the ministry, the various ministries 
that are trying to see how we can attract global students, make the Indian students stay here, foster more collaboration and more research in this. The, currently, if you see that uh, we are going to have, as I said, more students going to college even, it's going to increase as well. And the current gross enrollment ratio is about 27.3%. And the government is trying to increase it to 50%. So what it means is having more universities. And again, that is what the government is working on this. So what I see is when you have uh, more and more collaboration, more and more uh, partnerships with our, cap our uh, institutes of eminence, like IITs and these, are being allowed to set up campuses abroad as well. So we are increasing, making, uh, there's an effort to make Indian uh, education system at par with the global standards. And in the process to increase the foreign investment and to have more people-to-people -people connect. I'm really glad, you know, that I'm the in minority here, frankly, on this table. Because four of you are being, this, this is what we want, more and more academics, Asians, more and more students coming to uh, India, and then the tagline, you know, the Vasudeva Kutubang is, is this. That is what we are talking about. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, again, just some really important points around the aspect of funding, and then my research is on internationalization, and so I completely concur with the importance of what that brings in terms of the diversity of perspective. There's another initiative, it's called the Study in India Initiative as well, which is intentionally trying to recruit international students. So all of these focuses around the importance of internationalization is incredibly important. We are um, at the point now where we want to kind of open it up for conversation and questions from our audience. And so I see a lot of hands already um, being raised. Um, so so let's start with this young woman right here in the front. Yes. Thank you so much. So basically, uh, you all talked a lot about how there is a need for collaboration. And uh, in my uh, college, what I have seen is that there are a lot of students from different backgrounds. There are a lot of students who are from rural areas. And uh, in reality, there exists a gap. They are not, there is a difference between their understanding, their learning, and the kind of collaboration which is required. The point which you mentioned about the old solutions being implemented in new problems, that is not happening. So uh, is there something which colleges and schools can do so that uh, there is better communication and there is better kind of a collaboration between all the students uh, from different backgrounds, from different diversities. Thank you for your question. Um, I mean, I can kind of, I'll start, but then I'm, I'll open it up for other people as well. I mean, I think from the, the get-go, right, the importance around um, diversity is important and how we ensure that people who will come from diverse backgrounds have a seat at the table, right? But I think it goes back to that conversation that we were having around like pedagogy and instruction and educator and teacher preparation, right? Because that really is the foundation, right? Because if your teacher is saying, well, let's open up this space and let's have that conversation, then that becomes incredibly important. Um, but there's this aspect around funding as, as, as well, right? Because if you're in the rural village and you may not necessarily have access to the resources to be able to you know, support the educational system and the needs of students in that way. So it's a very um, intersectional or multifaceted question, but I'll turn it open to the panel as well if they have, um, have thoughts. Maybe I would add in terms of like creating this as educators, it's our role to create a safe space for young people where they can take ownership of, of their own learning journeys. And I think that is something that we are failing, that the educational system don't say by law, like, this is how education should be. And, but we have the power inside of the classrooms of how to create those spaces where people from different backgrounds, diversity, different uh, cultural or religious environments, can have a, a seat at the table and say, okay, this is what education should look like, this is how I want to learn and what do I want to learn. I think it's really important as educators to use like, different pedagogical frameworks or methodologies of creating the safe space, but not in a way of me, educator, I'm allowing you yeah. to speak up. 
because it keeps the power as to the educator. It's about like, let's co-create this space together. We are peers mm -hmm. here, and your opinion is as valuable as my, as my opinion. Now, in Iraq, uh, in Iraq uh, because of the conflict with ISIS, a lot of, a lot of uh, children had to flee their homes. And for three years, they lived in, in place, say, Syria or, or southern Turkey. And then after the conflict, many came back. When they came back to the classrooms, their levels were much lower uh, than those who had remained. And, and, and so in terms of levels, what could be done, uh, these uh, small, little accelerated learning programs, uh, to try and first bring them to the same academic level as those in the class in which they are in. And then after that, the other things that could be done is to ensure that, uh, you know, this, the old school buddy system where you pair students up uh, 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 to sort of help each other out, I think that's a very good thing. I think when I was here, I missed most of my classes, so I had like a 22% attendance. Uh, 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 no, 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 I was busy doing some, some good things, so don't worry. <laughs> uh, but, but what was important is I, I had a colleague uh, in, in, in the class, two of them, and literally they would bring me up to speed whenever I would come back. Uh, 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 and so this sort of a buddy system, it can be informal. Informal is better, but if not, maybe in the beginning set it up as formal, and then with time let it take its natural sort of space and, and, and pace, and I think that, that can help as well. Yeah. Um, another question. Uh, let's get... Let's get someone in the center there. This gentleman right here. Yes, you. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, guys. I guess it's morning. Sorry. <laughs> good morning. Uh, my uh, primary question is to Dr. Arjun Devre. Good morning, sir. Myself, uh, Shitit Sayonke. I belong to Dhule district. So uh, we belong to the same area. And it's a very backward uh, uh, rural area. Basically, I just have a basic question to you, sir, since you come from the bureaucracy. Uh, in India and all over the world, we are, we are looking at the parallel education market that is being built up in the name of EdTech. We see these startups EdTech that are turning into giant unicorns. And we also have this policy of right to education where we are supposed to provide with free education under 14 years of age. So uh, my basic question is that, if the education institutions are effective enough, why are these unicorns growing so rapidly? And if they are supposed to educate children, what's the use of these institutions? Uh, to give my, I mean, come, giving, uh, speaking from my experience. So my school, uh, it was a government aided school, a very small one. We had a piece of, uh, uh, for, from first to fourth was three and a half rupees per month. Fifth to 10th standard, the, it was free for everybody. And college was, I think, 100 rupees a year or something like this. This was our college. But uh, we never felt uh, at a disadvantage than kids going to a convent meeting. In our school, we always have a very good uh, student to teacher relationship. Right? You can ask the teacher whatever you want, I mean, and he will answer that. There was not much emphasis on uh, tuitions, you know, post school. I mean, you are supposed to go to school, you learn, and that's it. And then you do homework, let's say, whatever is given. And then you, at the end of the day, you go to your friends and you go. What happened in this entire process is, uh, obviously, I mean, my parents did their best, they tried to give me more books, and that is obviously there. But, uh, and I studied in Marathi medium till 10, so there's no problem in that as well. So what I see is there is more of a panic uh, that, okay, my, this, this fear of missing out, you know, FOMO. And in this entire process, what happens is you actually focus on what is immediate to you, okay? For example, I have twin daughters, and in their school, they're just, right now, I think, uh, they're just in senior KG right now. And their classmates are talking about something called Math Olympia, which is ridiculous. I mean, the kids, see, my, my basic question is this, 
If I ask you right now, what is 517 into, let's say, 629, what will you do? Tell me this. You open up your mobile phone. So why are we forcing our kids to do this complex maths and making them feel miserable when they can't? If the parents themselves can't. So obviously, see, every parent wants for their kids what is the best, OK? Irrespective of whether they themselves can achieve or not, by the way. <laughs> no, I am being serious. So there is this extra pressure that, okay, see, if I had this during my time, I would have done this. So I am providing you right now, so you better deliver on returns. I don't understand that nature, frankly. It's okay. I mean, obviously, you have to have some kind of accountability. Please, I mean, don't quote me anywhere else, you know, you know in your parents' disagreement. But... Uh, I understand you need to have some accountability, but there is the expectation how it has to be grounded in reality. If my father, my grandfather was a farmer, my father becomes a teacher, I can become a doctor. That is, you know, the normally I can understand. You cannot expect somebody, let's say, in a family, I mean, there are exceptions obviously, but this, this growing, uh, how do you say, panic even, let's say, for example, uh, to put, even if I speak at my house, English or not, my kid has to go to an English medium. But there is no supportive environment at home, so how will he, so he actually misses out on that. So I see that you need to have your education in your own language, so that you have a foundation where you can put your thought across in a proper manner, and the rest of it is just translation. You can easily pick up on that. But to say to this, I, I feel that, you know, obviously there is, people see that, okay, in school they are not being provided what they want, that is why they go for this, but there needs to be a understanding what exactly is needed, and see, as long as there is demand, there will be supply. Please understand this, and there is nothing wrong in that. But how much of money you want to throw to that solution, how much of panic or, as I said, the basics needs to be clear, you know, hardworking, you need to this, you need to have a critical understanding of certain things, basic finances you need to know, so that you make a person, you know, as a whole, not just parts that are, you know, seen shiny and one part is, you know, that for example, you're, you're going to a part salon, let's say, putting a lot of emphasis on, uh, let's say, going to a party, putting too much of a on your hair, making beautiful, but you're not well-dressed, you know? So this is the mismatch you might have, so something like this. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, we are kind of out of time because we want to just have some key like action steps in terms of moving forward. So I'd like to just hear from each one of you, like action steps that we can take around education reform. Uh, uh Number one, I think uh, invest in education. I think it is unacceptable that governments around the world uh, put more money in military than in education. It's totally unacceptable. Uh, 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 and it, it, is, it is evidence of how much we've really sort of uh, misplaced our priorities as, as a global community. Number two, uh, uh, educate young people to learn how to learn. Uh, 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 it's very important. The things that you know right now will be useless five years down the line. And so what is important is can you, can you learn quickly anything that is thrown at you because the, the next ten, five years, the future is going to be very, very complex and challenging. And then number three, finally, education should be embodied. Uh, it should be an embodied experience. It shouldn't be people just sitting in a class and listening and taking in information. It should be people uh, uh, engaging with the world and with the people in the environment that they live in. And finally, a good example, uh, the students of Symbiosis here, in addition to being in this beautiful campus, should also run it. They should try and maintain it. They should contribute to whatever it is they eat, uh, uh, one way or the other. Everything. It shouldn't be just, you know, I'm here, my environment is there. No, education is has to be very, very embodied. Thank you. Thank you. Sophia? Yes, I believe on the key points I would like to remark before we end this session, it will be that education system has to be thought 
and think about and plan for every student, for the needs of every student. The needs I have, the needs Ulysses have, the needs Kwani has are really different. And especially thinking the most marginalized and the poor background kids, because we, for example, in Argentina, we have uh, a really high quality public universities, but it's not just, okay, let's make public universities and that's the, that's the, that's the solution to everything, but we have a lot of other problems. There are students in the same city that have to travel like three hours to get to these public universities, or they don't have money for this transportation, or they don't have the time, or they have to work to provide for their families, to help to put a food, uh, a, um, a food at the table at the end of the day, and they have to contribute with that as well. So thinking about education for the needs of every student, that would be number one. Number two is to rethink why are we studying? Why are we accessing higher education? Not thinking, okay, what job I'm going to have when I finish, but to think what's the purpose of that? How I'm going to take all the knowledge I have, all the skills I've acquired, to put it in at the service of finding solutions to address the global challenges we have. And the third thing, it will be to, to be responsible of our education and to do something to save the future of our generation. We have to engage more in education, demand our world leaders, educate about what are the educational policies in our countries, what can I do from my place in the NGO I volunteer, in the job I have, in my university, in my school, what can I do from my place to improve that education? And demand world leaders to give more funding to education to actually uh, think of better solutions that are sustainable in time. So those would be my three key things. Thank you. Um, from my part, when it comes to funding and speaking on a global level, coming from a global South country within the G20, is how do we find better strategy of funding for developing countries? Talking about funding from a Western European perspective is way easier than speaking from a country that has a huge national debt to the lovely IMF that limits our capability to invest in education, so we have to work really heavily on how can de developing countries invest way more money on education. Then when we talk about education, we, most of us, if not all of us, we think of only schools, but learning doesn't happen only in schools. We have to include non-formally education into the conversation, into the educational reforms, because they're playing a key role when it comes to sk uh, skill development, especially hard skills. And then echoing Sophia, we had to start thinking education from a holistic point of view, not only from a mere workforce perspective. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, for, uh, from my point, I will just, I mean, majority things have been said. This is one more point that I would like to stress again is to have vocational education. I mean, in schools, you know, normally we have studied how to do plumbing, how to do welding. I know this. I mean, we have we've been taught how to do, let's say, if a, if a button falls off, uh, you know, switch, so I can repair that, and so I did not call somebody else. So, and there is no, uh, how to say, uh, stigma to that, you know, recognize the work of hard labor. So that is, that is one point that I want to just... And if Thank someone, you. as a young person, if someone tells you you are the future, that person is part of the problem. <gasps> what the yes. hell is the future? What is the future? We are the present. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, thank you again so much to everyone um, who participated on the panelists, our extinguished panelists today, all of the students, administrators, dignitaries here at Symbiosis. Thank you so much for this uh, enlightening conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, panelists, for such a thought-provoking and exciting session. Thank you all for being with us here today. To felicitate the panelists and the moderator, I would like to call upon stage Dr. Bhama, Dean Academics, SIU.